So today, in the second Sunday of Advent, our focus is hospitality. As a matter of fact, in the book, the chapter that Paul lays out is joy and the practice of hospitality. Now, that might seem odd to some people, and I know that in reading the chapter, or even talking about what does it mean to offer ourselves in hospitality to others, that sometimes that is scary. That being a hospitable people, sometimes it's hard to find the joy in that when we're being pushed outside of our comfort zones and challenged to actually confront and encounter those who are different. Maybe those who look different. Maybe those who even view the world differently. Maybe even those who don't have much for us. Maybe those who consider us the other. And yet in the gospel over and over and over again, at the very foundation, Christ reminds us that as a people who trust in what God is doing and what God has done for us, that we cannot stay idle, we cannot you know, protect ourselves from the world, but rather we are propelled into the world through the power of the Holy Spirit to offer ourselves for others just as Jesus Christ offered himself for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. But that's challenging, and I get it. I'm with you, brothers and sisters, because there's no other question that I get more often, at least here in our community at Cornerstone, is how are we called to be hospitable to those who want to hurt us or even kill us or don't like us or who don't want us to be a part of their community or even enter into the conversation with us? It's a scary world, amen? There's a lot of terrible things going on in this world, and those terrible things produce fear. I find myself sometimes confronted with all the bad news that's going on in the midst of the world and getting a little afraid about that. There are wars and rumors of wars. There is violence all around. There are people enacting terrible terrorism or acts of terror against others. And in those extreme situations, they do harm to our brothers and sisters. It generates a spirit of fear. But I will remind you that the gospel... And Jesus Christ tells us that we are not a people who embrace a spirit of fear, but we are a people who enter into the abundant life that comes through Christ. And at the center of that is love. Now, I'm not talking about warm, fuzzy love, hokey love, I like you, you like me kind of love. I don't, I don't, I'm not talking about Hallmark love. I know some of you have spent the whole month watching Hallmark movies. <laughs> you know, I, I tend to not be an overly sentimental dude, and I can't watch Hallmark movies. They make me a little queasy, to be honest, all right? <laughs> but that's the love that everybody kind of thinks about when, you, when we talk about love. But when we talk about God's kind of love, we're talking about risky love. We're talking about a love that goes to the end, a love that's willing to give it all for the hope that is life. We experience that in Jesus, amen? And Jesus' self-giving love for us, the risky love, the love in which you find yourself alone on a cross. But death could not hold him, praise be to God. Love brought him from the grave. Love gives new life. It births something new in us. And I get it because the world bombards us with all the bad news. I mean... We live in a time where we can't get away from it, can we? And it doesn't seem that they're sharing a lot of good news. Uh, that doesn't sell papers. Oh, oh, papers, what is that? <laughs> How many of you still read the newspaper? Wow, that's a lot of you. You all must be over 50. <laughs> you like reading the newspaper? I, I told the early service, I said, uh, my father, by the way, has been a faithful participant at Cornerstone from the beginning. It's just because by birth, you know, relationship. No, I'm just kidding. But he's been a faithful commit to that. So every Sunday for 23 years at Cornerstone, my father has met me at, in the morning to get things set up for Cornerstone. Uh, the very first thing we did together is we used to set the sign up by the road at Big Cypress Elementary School. That was a heavy sign, wasn't it? Uh, and so he's always here. What he does in the early service now that we've transitioned, and we have two services, is he still comes to early service. And we talk about sports and how Duke did and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, important stuff. 
<laughs> and then he gets his newspaper and he goes up there and he reads his newspaper and waits till the second service so that he can join my mother in the second service. Y'all supposed to go off. Oh. Hallmark. <laughs> um, but in the early service, I actually called him out. So now everybody in the early service knows what's going on. <laughs> because I said, how are you doing? And he went, I'm up here reading the newspaper. Right. So, you know, but, but the newspaper, uh, well, good to see a good number of you read it, is not the primary means of communication or news. Uh, we can get it through the radio, most of us get it on the internet, some of us listen to different channels, whatever it is, the news is out there, the media is bombarding us with all this news that comes from all over the world. As a matter of fact, it's changed so much that I remember just a couple weeks ago, Leslie and I are driving down the road and we heard a news story about a car accident, a terrible car accident in Massachusetts. Now, that might not seem strange to you who are alive in this time. But I can recall not just 15 years ago that we would have never heard a story about a car accident in Massachusetts. See, the world is getting smaller. We know a lot more about what's going on in the world, all over the world. And there are some terrible things going on in this world, but there are also an enormous amount of beautiful things going on in the world. So do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid, because the light overcomes the darkness, amen. amen. Even though it seems that the darkness has its moment, it seems like all we hear about is the darkness, we are called to be a people of light, and we are called to be a people who are not bound in our fear, but liberated through Christ to bear witness to this good news. Praise be to God. Now, this is not a popular thing to say to the modern church, but in the ancient world, in the early Christian church, sharing the good news was so risky that it usually ended by losing your life. So if you think of the 12 disciples, you all know how many of them actually lived to an old age? One, right? See, in the early church, the good news of Jesus was dangerous good news. And even after the disciples, many, many Christian brothers and sisters who shared this radical hospitality, who were willing to go into the front lines, amen? Who were willing to confront the principalities and power, who were willing to give themselves for others, even at the risk of their own life, that all may know the good news of Jesus Christ, the really, 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 really good news of Jesus. And he invites us to participate in that with him. Praise be to God. Do we have any risk takers out there? Okay, we'll sign the four of you up. <laughs> you see, what I'm saying is, is that our fear causes us to remove ourselves from the other. And that's not what God is calling us to do, amen? Our fear might make us want to build a, I mean, I'm not going to go there, okay, anyways. <laughs> Something to protect us from the other, amen? But in the church, in our life, in our relationship with Jesus Christ, there are no borders or boundaries, for all are one in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it is in our diversity that we find the beauty of unity. It is not in our uniformity. Not in our uniformity. And so, the good work of hospitality is what we're about. Now, I know some of you thought that we were about getting you into heaven. <laughs> That's the ISIS. <laughs> what we're about is becoming a people so in love with Jesus and so open to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives that we become radical lovers of all others. And it should pique a curiosity within us to actually want to experience those we've never met. Or maybe have heard about that scare us a little. And in participating in that act of hospitality, that's where we find joy. 
because we become aware that we are all one. We are all siblings. Some of my greatest adventures in my life and in faith have been going out of my way, stepping outside of my comfort zones to meet somebody I never knew before, to have conversations with them, to hear their stories, and to realize that they welcome me and I welcome them. We embrace each other as a common humanity. Sure, we have differences. But we bear witness to the love of God in the world when we offer ourselves to others in that way. And that's not to say I'm perfect, amen? Amen. You are screwed up. <laughs> I am. Right. But I try. I strive. Because that's who Christ calls us to be. Praise be. It's a messy place we're at, called Cornerstone. And as I was thinking about hospitality, I was thinking about us and our community. And what does it mean to be a hospital people? And I got to thinking about this book that I read. It's called Christianity for the Rest of Us. It was uh, written by a lady by the name of Dr. Diana Butler Bass. It says here in the little seller teaser that this was named one of the best books of the year by Publishers Weekly. And it was also mentioned that this was the most important book of the decade about emerging Christianity and the renewal of mainline congregations. Wow, that's pretty hefty stuff. And so I dived into this, and I found that in chapter 5, the whole chapter is about hospitality, and I just wanted to read a couple pages from it to you. Are you all cool with that? Okay. But I'm going to need to borrow somebody's reading glasses. So, <laughs> okay, there we go. Thank you for the hospitality. <laughs> How do I look? <laughs> Marvelous. So, so I want you to pay attention. I know this is not typical form uh, for a good sermon. You just read from a book. But uh, I think this is important. For you to hear. It says, occasionally, this is Diana Butler Bass talking, I've attended churches with hospitality programs or welcome committees where friendliness seems little more than a phony act to get newcomers to join the church. <laughs> At such places, hospitality typically follows a secular model, such as neighborhood welcome wagons of the 1960s, which, for all its friendliness, was essentially a way to promote certain stores and products. Did you all know that the stores have more influence on your life than you think? Yeah, we can come back to Hallmark later. In some churches, hospitality appears to be a code word for promotion, with the church as the primary product, selling Jesus, in other words. Or maybe the way to heaven, at least that's the focus. Then you realize you have to do some work, Oh, I, I'm, I digress. Hospitality is an instrument used for another end, to sign people up as pledging members. I'm all for that line. <laughs> True Christian hospitality is not a recruitment strategy designed to manipulate strangers into church membership. Rather, it is a central practice of the Christian faith, something Christians are called to do for the sake of that thing itself. Hospitality draws from the ancient tap roots of the Christian faith, from the soil of the Middle East, where it is considered a primary virtue of community. Although it is a practice shared by Jews and Muslims, for Christians, hospitality holds special significance. Christians welcome strangers as we ourselves have been welcomed into God through the love of Jesus Christ. Wow. We were all once strangers. But God welcomed us in. Mm. Through hospitality, Christians imitate God's welcome. Therefore, hospitality is not a program, not a single hour or ministry in the life of the congregation. It stands at the heart of a Christian way of life, a living icon of wholeness in God. We don't care who you are, explained one Cornerstone member. Where you came from, what color you are, what your background is, with whom you share your life. You are here, now, at Cornerstone, and you are a brother or a sister in Christ. Amen. Did you all know you were in a book? <laughs> 
Did you? A couple of you might have remembered this, right? In 2006, Diana Butler Bass came to Cornerstone because she was told by somebody that this crazy radical church down in Naples, Florida, welcomed everybody. <laughs> and so we became a part of this study where she was learning from retraditioning church, as she called it. And guess what? We're the first actual chapter in the book, <laughs> chapter five on hospitality. Go figure. Wow. <laughs> I continue. <laughs> Some of Cornerstone's people have never been part of the church before, often had previously been members of strict and conservative denominations such as the Southern Baptist. A few have joined other main, from other mainline Protestant congregations, and some are recovering Catholic. Oh, no, she didn't say that. I said that. <laughs> and, and a few are growing from the Roman Catholic Church. Very few grew up in Florida. Marcia, a congregational leader who was reared in an Anabaptist tradition, confessed that after moving to Naples, she did not go to church. For eight years, she says, we wandered around. Arriving at Cornerstone, she and her husband found the sense of freedom in welcoming. There's a lot of freedom here to be who we are, she said. I think that's really neat. Now, by the way, you're all trying to figure out who these people are. Names have been changed to protect the innocent. Unfortunately, Diane didn't realize that the names she picked were also names of people who are already here. <laughs> that sense of freedom exemplifies Christian hospitality. Somehow the way we do church equalizes. We are all the same, said one woman trying to explain the congregation. Sameness, however, does not mean conformity. You walk in and you don't feel pressure to conform. There are a lot of churches you go to go in and everybody looks like they came from a cookie cutter. They're always the same. And if you don't fit in, then you don't feel comfortable. But hospitality, a radical, biblical, and democratic practice, opens the way for all people to be the same under God, part of the same family, welcomed for who they are and all their uniqueness. We're who we are, said Scott, a former Episcopalian, real honest to God, real. Another member recalled his experience in a different congregation where he was treated as an outsider for being conservative and not conservative enough and therefore not Christian enough. Evidently, that congregation offered hospitality based on one's voting record. I've got two more pauses. We, we, I mean, the body of Christ have got to stop playing partisan politics. We, the body of Christ, I don't care who you vote for. Well, I do, but in this place, I don't want to have that conversation, right? I want our focus to be unity in Christ. I also want to challenge you I think we should do this as a congregation. We might do this in the summer, right before the elections. You're allowed to talk about the issues that are important to you, but you can't mention a single name of a candidate. Because they're all selling themselves to you just like Hallmark is. Okay? They're buying your vote. I don't care what party. It's time for the church to speak up and be the voice God intended us to be as prophets and let everybody know that there's some things we just do not stand for because it does not reflect the image of Christ. All right, back to the book. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, there it is. Sadly, many Americans experience congregations as judgmental places with strict rules of appearance and behavior. But God's hospitality demands otherwise, that all are welcome. At Cornerstone, an easy sense of authentic hospitality extends across the congregation. Praise band members look like working class biker guys. <laughs> and I'm trying to think, in 2006, we didn't look like a bunch of biker guys. We still might. We still might. You were there playing the little 
that, they were talking about you. <laughs> At one point in the service, a guitarist said, I was frightened because I hadn't been to church before. But this congregation didn't feel like being herded as cattle. Music got me in the door. Although hospitality at Cornerstone is free, it is not without cost. Indeed, Christians who enter into the practice of welcoming the stranger know that it is risky and sometimes dangerous. This is my next pause. Hospitality, and I'm going to say this, it's important for us to have general hospitality. You know, prepare ourselves to welcome those who are coming in off the street. I like Mike's idea of parking in the back, give some parking spots up the front, coffee, fellowship, making sure we have a couple of greeters to make sure that nobody gets left out when they walk in the door. That's all good stuff, but that is not in and of itself the definition of Christian hospitality. Christian hospitality is always willing to take the risk on behalf of the other that they may experience the good news of Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? It is dangerous work to be an embodiment of good news in the midst of the world. And guess what? A good number of people don't want anything to do with it. Because if you invite them to confront their own brokenness and their own pain and their own division and their own pride and prejudice, a lot of times they don't want to have to work with that. It's a heck of a lot easier just to go down the street to a place that is feeding you and feeding you the stuff you like. One time, years ago, a friend of mine and I were walking up to the 7-Eleven and we decided that we wanted to eat only things we liked that day. And so that day we decided that the thing we liked the most was Cool Whip. <laughs> so we went to the 7-Eleven and we bought the jumbo-sized tubs of Cool Whip and we got a spoon and we both ate the entire tub. I'm sharing this story just to let you know that if people hand feed you only the stuff you think you like, you're only gonna get sick. <laughs> Another question people have had about Cornerstone, and we've had, I've had conversations with people about this, and, 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 and this I think is important for you to know. And we don't get it right all the time. Let me just say that. We are a messy place. Beautifully messy. Um, matter of fact, we're going to tell you one of our, our postcards we'd like to send out in the next couple months because we want to market Jesus to everybody. Okay, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. You know, if you follow the sermon, that's not the point. But anyways, Mike and I have been working on this line. We wanted to say, on the front of the postcard, I'll say, would you like to come to a church where every, everyone's welcome, where there's no judgment, where there's nothing but peace and harmony and love. Then you flip it over and says, we're not that church. <laughs> but, we're, but we're working on it. <laughs> because we're not. We're not. But, but what I want to tell you is, is that some people have asked the question, why is it Cornerstone bigger? You know, I've been here 23 years. Why aren't we a mega church? We should have thousands of people pouring in here. Well, we should. But not everybody likes what they hear here. It's just the truth. And I'm not, that's not patting myself on back. I, I run people off all the time. <laughs> because I'm not going to play that game. I'm not willing to accommodate to that. I, I've strived, let me just say. Well, I've accommodated plenty, but I strive not to. You know? um, they're, they're, you know, Leslie and I always joke. We say the people come to Cornerstone, they're here for a couple months, and they're like, we love this church. It's lively. The people are friendly. All that kind of stuff. And then they go, what did he say? <laughs> because I don't have any problem confronting all the things that in the United States we sometimes have elevated to be the most important and part of that might be our own nationalism but our allegiance is to Christ and Christ alone yeah. Amen. And so I strive for that and invite everybody to join me because I'm growing in it too but it's messy and it's risky and it can be a little dangerous. All right, last part of the book, ready? <laughs> Hospitality is not a tame practice, an option to offer only to those who are likable. As the ancient Christian theologian Gregory of Nessa said, reminded his flock, 
a stranger, those who are naked without food, infirm, and imprisoned are the ones the gospel intends for you. Hospitality can be frightening at times. The people of Cornerstone know this. One man shared a story about Rick, a man who challenged the congregation's hospitality. He comes with tattoos, terrible guy, <laughs> addiction problems, even long braided, different colored hair all over his head. But he insisted the congregation, but he, the pastor, insisted the congregation accept Rick as a human being in need of God's love. People saw him. Still, it is risky welcoming Rick because he continues to struggle with life issues and is in and out of jail because of his addictions and inappropriate behavior. Yet the people of Cornerstone know and accept him, holding him accountable for his faith journey and actions. This is not the kind of miracle story people like to hear. The Cornerstone member, a Cornerstone member admitted, but it is part of the real world. At Cornerstone, they speak of living the apostolic core of Christianity, a reference to a brief sentence in the book of Acts. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, and the breaking of bread and prayers. An essential part of that early Christian teaching and fellowship was hospitality, a practice that awed even the Roman opponents of Jesus' first followers. are in Christ Jesus. It invites us to take the risk that all may know the good news of Jesus Christ and that we may begin to meet our brothers and sisters, siblings all over the world, regardless of where they find themselves, the color of their skin, their nationality, their gender, their sexual orientation, their economic background. Can I keep going? <laughs> Because we are all one in Christ Jesus, who is Lord. Let's let the world know that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.